Still all independent. It's crazy, bro. In the morning, waking up early, kitchen table, <laughs> waking up before these kids across the street get in there. <laughs> Tree houses and start yelling outside. Your parents listen. Probably listen to our show. Hey, well, become Patreons. <laughs> <laughs> become Patreons. <laughs> uh, but we up here in the morning, you know what I'm saying? Hard work and dedication, trying to get this uh, politics and these these thoughts out. You feel me? Uh, thoughts that hopefully, you know, stir your mind up to get busy and to do some action. Because this ain't just a, a podcast for the sake of talking it ain't the podcast for the sake of us getting on panels and talking about our politics but this is a podcast to hopefully inspire you to get involved in your in your community and to take action about uh what we was learning and what we was talking about and the things you was learning by yourself and in your own study or with a study group you know what i'm saying we, we trying to be about that action be about building these programs be about serving the community be about housing people uh, be about feeding people be about you feel me getting people clothed health care mm-hmm. farming you know really trying to build this autonomy you know what i'm saying for the people by the people you know so hella black episode 144 we back how you feeling brother mm. i feel similar to you i've come to understand this as the people's podcast i think that's our intention you know uh to speak to the masses of the people in a way that will do the things that you said, uh, organize and mobilize them. I'm happy that we're at episode 144. I I don't know how how often I say this, but I really wish we could do more. I really really do. Uh, But there's only so much time in a day to do this. Uh, But, you know, the organization is growing. And so as we get more members, uh, that takes sp- certain things off our, off our hands, and we will be able to uh, produce this show. Because I, I look at content coming from other sectors of, uh, I don't know, I guess the quote-unquote left, and they pushing shit out Whatever every day. That means. You know, but they, they're pushing <laughs> stuff out every day. And, yeah. um, it's super informative, right? But it... it it's lacking. You know, the, uh, the analysis of people who are attached to the new African independence movement, right? Who are attached to a movement for sovereignty for uh, black people in the so-called United States. And with that being, you know, uh, 13 to 15% of this nation's population, um, we need to be making things geared to them or who else will they turn to? They'll turn to, you know, the liberals or they'll turn to the grand old party, you know, the Republican party. And so in terms of the democratic socialist, you know, there's just, it's so many, <laughs> it's so many options out there for them that in order for us to keep up, um, we need to be, uh, active in every area, the same way that they are. So that's, you know, I would say most of these platforms have a daily show, but when you start dealing with, you know, the, uh, the big media conglomerates like a MSNBC or a CNN or a Fox, they're not every, they have every, Every hour. every minute on the minute reporting, yeah. you know, and providing a perspective, right? Uh, providing a agenda, how to think, to think, or, or, or what to think. Yeah. They're providing a what to think, you know. And so for us, we at least got to be able to combat that. And I think we've done a, a better job with uh, being able to produce a weekly show. But like, let's say, for example, the reason why we couldn't do, the reason why we haven't recorded in so long is because we went, we traveled for cadre work, and then we had our own uh, weekly PE for people's programs and then the, the actual program we have to do all the administrative and logistical work for the back end of the programs and the different fundraising efforts right it's uh, only so many hours in the day versus oh. where if you were a reporter yeah. for fox there's people who are writing Producing, the scripts writing there's people literally who, you know just reading from a teleprompter good day america <laughs> and hopefully we get to that point though where we Show got up, you know uh, hundreds of members where it's like hey you know we just are the voices or we turn into the actual writers and producers that are someone else who's more char- charismatic and who, are, you know, who could possibly host a podcast or whatever other uh, media entities we do. And so in short, I am glad to be here. Grateful to be here. I'm happy that we are hopefully going to be able to, I want to say hopefully, I believe we're going to provide a much needed uh, foundational 
analysis on, you know, um, we, we already provided with our last, not our last episode, but about two or three episodes ago, we did something on bricks. Yeah. All right, so we're going to be talking about bricks. Um, bricks plus what now? Huh? Yeah, talking about <laughs> bricks, bricks plus, and what it means for the new African independence movement, what it means for black people here in the United States or Africans across the, uh, across the diaspora. Um, we're going to be talking about, you know, um, electoral politics. And I, yeah, I think it's a much needed topic and much needed perspective that we need to provide to get people to start to question the way they've been taught to think about these mm-hmm. things. Now, we only going to have like 45 minutes to an hour, so we can never fully discuss these topics um, in the way that they, the way that we could. But if you look at the previous episodes, not just the Briggs episode, but throughout, it can help you provide, I guess, get a full scope analysis on mm-hmm. where we land on uh, some of these institutions, organizations, et cetera. Yeah, and if you ain't listened to that Briggs episode, I say go back and listen to that after this, you know, or, you know, maybe hit the pause button right here. And go back and listen to that first, mm-hmm. but you know, I don't want to lose our uh, listeners. You know, the, the, these apps these days, you get distracted. All of a sudden, you switching between the podcast episode, then you want to you want to TikTok binge or something. <laughs> so, either listen to it first or listen to it after. But you know, it's uh, some new developments in this world. Things are changing. It's episode one thirty nine, the one that we're referring to. Episode, episode one thirty nine, and it's on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. go to our YouTube dot com slash Hell Black Pod and tap in with that. You can watch it on your big screen. You can watch it on your small screen. You can watch it on your iPhone. You can watch it on your iPad. You might have a Samsung. You can watch it on that. You know what I'm saying? Tap in with it. YouTube dot com slash Hell Black Pod. And while we're promoting, you feel me? Go to our SoundCloud. SoundCloud dot com slash Hell Black Podcast. Apple Podcast. Spotify. Amazon, all we we pretty much everywhere, you know what I'm saying? But go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash hellblackpod. Subscribe, you feel me? Support the real. You know, these uh, other podcasts got a lot of support. We got to support the the new African podcast, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. And like you said, uh, where you told people to go pause and listen to episode 139, just pause and go to patreon.com and send it to somebody, bro. Like five, it's, it's I think our lowest tier is five dollars, and that that really does go a long way. And just being able to even take a break and do some of the research for this stuff, you know, uh, I we got to do a bunch of research on these topics, or we can just come up here and talk, ramble, and, and just make, you know, yeah. Anyone that's tried to teach somebody anything, you know how much you got to learn to be able to teach it, or to know how much, to, or how much you have to, how much information you have to acquire, how much knowledge you have to acquire, just to be able to even speak on it in a a fluent and detailed way, you know. So if you Want us to be able to do more research, uh, to get more guests, all these different things. You know, it's going to take a little bit more money, but hopefully $5 for those that have the ability to sacrifice it. Think about it. You investing in the people. <laughs> what J. Cole say? That, that 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 CD cost the same as two number threes, what he said for McDonald's. <laughs> now, I ain't going to do it. I don't know. It's $5 is when you got a... You know, the cost of basic essential needs like bread, water, fish, toilet paper and shit costing uh, a 70% increase since 2020. Uh, some people actually might not have $5. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, I understand. But if, if you, you do, yeah, and you got more than $5. I know you, you, you know one person. Bro, yeah, somebody got $5. Who got $5? I like, feel hey, it. I support feel this. It. <laughs> support this. Even if it's just a one-time donation. You, feel uh, you ain't got to we'll be, be a monthly month. subscriber. Yeah. But yeah, support that Patreon. Bricks Plus, man. So, what's your biggest takeaways? Bricks plus six. Well, I think just to start to give people a refresher, you know, in the previous episode, we talked about bricks and uh, the formation of this uh, multipolar world, meaning that multi uh, nations have power rather than a unipolar world where the uh, United States and, uh, you know, the international uh, monopoly, monopoly capitalism of the West is in complete control. So now with the development of bricks uh, and these geopolitical shifts, you know, these world shifts. Uh, BRICS is now uh, another block aiming to compete with, you know, what they call the, the G7, mm-hmm. you know, uh, competing with them, right? So now you have BRICS, this new formation, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Saudi, UAE, Argentina, Iran, Ethiopia, and Egypt, mm-hmm. right? So you have now... Nearly 50% of the world's population in this new uh, economic superstructure uh, where, you know, they're openly calling for de-dollarization, right? Openly calling for what some might say is a de-investment from the West in terms of uh, economic structure, 
um, which you know only time will tell, mm-hmm. right? So we we seen this new these new shit from this from this uh, uh, this BRIC summit. So initial takeaways is you know this is uh, nations uh, which have their own national interest coming together uh, and saying that you know we are tired of the dollar, we are tired of the West dictating all of our lives, mm-hmm. and we want to have a chance at attempting to dictate our own. I think about nations like the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran that has faced the most sanctions out of any other nation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And those sanctions is war to where a country can literally, uh, is essentially blackballed from the rest of the world markets and is unable to secure money, unable to secure their own assets that they have frozen, unable to secure certain medicine for their people. You feel mm-hmm. me? So that is a, a, a genocidal tactic on a nation. So you have a nation that has uh, been sanctioned for so long, now become a part of uh, a block, an economic block, to when out the sanctions essentially have been subverted, you know. So a lot of ways, it's is, uh, you can say for some, you know, it's the chickens coming home to roost. Like they, it's, uh, the West tried to starve some of these nations, you know what I'm saying? And now these nations are able to come to this new uh, economic superstructure to be able to trade, uh, to be able to develop, um, you know, as well as we know, there's this bank associated with it that's giving loans out to uh, developing countries mm-hmm. in the name of development, right? Um, and we can't just be like, oh, it's this complete. You know what I'm saying? It ain't the same thing as developing from a capitalist uh, standpoint. You no, know what I'm no, saying? No, to definitely where you not. have the IMF and the World Bank and these terrible loans. Now banks are going to be able to develop in a certain type, or countries now have the opportunity to turn to BRICS mm-hmm. to develop a certain type of way. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so it's a, it's a shift. Yeah. It's a shift and only time will tell on, you know, uh, what's going to come from it, right? Um, because ultimately, you know, there's going to be contradictions within it. I'm not going to just lambast it, but, you know, I mean, if you look at uh, India, Algeria was supposed to uh, become a part of BRICS, but India blocked Algeria becoming part of BRICS. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and the French was the ones who went to the Indians and said, hey, man, Francois, Francois, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> and just don't come into BRICS. Don't let Algeria come into BRICS. Now we put that in the situation of what's going on right now in West Africa, mm-hmm. if Algeria was in BRICS, that's going to improve Algeria's GDP, which will allow Algeria to support these other West African nations right now that is battling who? The, the French. French. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's going to be interesting, you know what I'm saying, it's uh, it's business deals that is happening, like he was saying. It's like these different business deals that is happening between yeah. nations with their own national interests. So we're going to see how these nations uh, that actually, you know, care about the people that actually want to advance, um, you know, uh, people, the the humanity of people and mm-hmm. their uh, material needs versus nations that still might be in it for their own economic, uh, capitalist interests. Yeah, for sure. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah, yeah that's a. I feel similar to you. We got to see how it all plays out. Like how, uh, I guess how like uh, Lula da Silva and Xi Jinping and Putin, like how do their relationships develop with the West and the quote unquote developing countries, right? Uh, and I, I do think it's, as it pertains to like geopolitics, right? Um, the arena where you have these different nation states and blocks fighting for like dominance and influence. We are living in a historical time period, you know. Uh, as it pertains to, to this moment, I would say shit, for pretty much most of our lives, it's been, uh, you know, this imperialist, neo-colonialist domination by uh, Western Europe and Western Europe's uh, settler colony aka the United States, right? But now you have this block where prior to what you said is 50% of the world's population now with it's, the six. Uh, I believe the exact number is 46%. 46. We know it's about to be 50%. Yeah, and it was... it was uh, <laughs> Especially because the West, you feel me? Like, we ain't... The West ain't having children the same way that these mm-hmm. other nations are. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so before the new additions a couple weeks ago, you had uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa accounting for like 31% of the world's total GDP, right? So that's like a lot of economic power, right? And now you add the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Saudi, yeah. and Iran. <laughs> Three of the biggest the oil producers. Oil producers yeah. You feel me? It's yeah. okay. We could talk about climate change and oil and the cha- need for it changes, electric cars. Yeah. It changes a lot of things. It changes, especially if we're talking about the petrodollar mm-hmm. and then the economic, you know, uh, how that boosts up the West. You feel me? And how the West has been in, in bed, essentially, with the Saudis for so long. So now we're going to see, like, all right, how is this, what's going to happen with these shifts? You know what I'm saying? Is it going to yeah. shift out of it? 
you know, it seems like that's what's going to happen, but what, what's what's actually going to happen? You know, because if we know historically, especially with the Saudis, they, you know, they, they'll play both sides. <laughs> so we'll see. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And But it is, it is an important, I think it is, it's an important shift from the West. It's an important shift from the West. So we'll just see what happens. Objectively speaking. Yeah. You feel me? Just like these other. Like it's a step. This yeah. ain't the solution. This ain't liberation. This ain't freedom. It ain't, you feel me? People, uh, some someone actually I respect and look to for like world affairs said, oh, this is revolution. This is a revolutionary thing. And I'm just like, hey, I don't. Only time well, will tell. Only time will tell. Why like, we can't just be so quick? Oh, just because it's de-dollarization, that means revolution. Because many of these nations on the list still function uh, through capitalist ideology and capitalist economic system, mm. you know, which is yeah. exploitative. At the end of the day, it's just what you. And, and so, uh, but and we know that steps to move towards an egalitarian and communal system. Mm-hmm. We know there's steps to it. Yeah, so for we sure. have to see if there's if that will step to it. But some of these nations historically, oh, they haven't been, you feel me, for the people. I think one right. of the biggest takeaways based off of what you said earlier as well is um it just gives these, you know, quote unquote developing countries another option. Right? Mm-hmm. I think what a lot of people don't recognize or have come to understand when you are dealing with um Western entities like the World Bank, like NATO, uh like IMF, these things that were uh, born out of uh, World War II, the end of World War II, right, in Europe not having so much infrastructure or power, even just actual, like, humans left because the war was fought on their soil, right, in the U.S., um, being able to become a global power after this, right, where you see the United Nations move to New York, where you see the uh, NATO move to New York, right? Um, it just gives these... When these IMF and, and and these Western institutions are quote unquote helping develop these other places, it comes with these shitty loan interests that you were talking about, right? It comes with USA. It comes with the Central Intelligence Agency. It, it comes, comes with, with Western trained leaders and military period. craft. It comes. <laughs> you can't. You got to use this. You got to use this architecture company. You got to use this shipping company. You have to use these tools, this industry, these enterprises, and they're all owned by the United States or the West under the guise of developing your country. Now, if I come like, B, I'm trying to make you self-sufficient, bro, period. I'm going to help you uh, plant these pl- I'm going to help you start your garden, right? But I'm going to send the technical support to you, but we're going to make sure your people is trained to become the manager. That's a different thing versus me. Hey, nigga, if you, under the guise of self-sufficiency, you got to buy my shit, you got to use my tools, you got to use my crew. What do you have? Yeah. But a finished product that still, once the finished product is done, now I'm sending my people to come manicure the lawns, mm-hmm. to come do the pesticides, to come, you know, it's just like what, that's that's what happens in, mm-hmm. you know, historically, um, like nations like China haven't done that, whereas, you know, we're going to send a few people over there and we also want to help actually develop your people, uh, teach them the skills so that y'all can do this on your own. The yeah. West doesn't do that. The West wants to handicap you. Yeah. And if they can't handicap you, they'll do what? Hit you with sanctions, like you said, which are a genocidal act. You feel mm-hmm. me? Like if... It was to the point where, uh, you know, a lot of these nations weren't able to get access to the vaccine. Yeah. People died because of that. And it was giving them the worst vaccine possible, too. Yeah. And this ain't saying I'm pro-vaccine, but, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what they was doing. Vaccine is just, excuse me, vaccine is just one example. You know, they, yeah. at, at one point, was, uh, wasn't, like, I think it was, like, was Afghanistan. <laughs> but wasn't Afghanistan, they had, like, a sanction on them to where they couldn't get... Uh, Asthma medication. I think that was Iran. Iran, Probably Afghanistan yeah. too. So they, where they couldn't get asthma medication, like, come, like, bro, like children, bro. Like, you know, you feel me? That's that's. But but I think that's why it's important for us to have like a very like balanced understanding and not get too excited, not get too, mm-hmm. def- you know. It's like, yeah, this we should have some hope, right? We should have some uh, uh, optimism, some it's revolutionary at least another optimism. Option. It's a, that's it's how a I shift look at it. Hap- happening yeah. in the world, you know. But I think to your point. A lot of people sometimes they'll take okay any country that is involved with Africa they just automatically call imperialist, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like okay if China is involved with Africa they're oh imperialism, get it like this uh, if for Russia China is involved oh imperialism oh you know uh, uh, Iran involved oh imperialism it's like what are we like countries nations are going to have relations with other nation states that's the simple fact but what is that relationship is it a relationship? of uh, cooperation is a, a relationship of helping develop another nation because nations do need help with developing you know what i'm saying is it a mutual cooperation that's happening economically in the economic sphere you feel me right that's how these nations work is they make deals we have that are yeah. helpful or either not helpful you know what i'm saying <laughs> like, like iran and china just made a deal 
where they're bartering, I believe, uh, uh, oil from Iran, mm-hmm. and then China is saying we will uh, rebuild. Uh, we'll give you the support to rebuild Imam Khomeini Airport. Well, that's 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 like a beneficial deal. Yeah. Versus the West coming in, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, as an example, the West coming in with the IMF, okay, we'll build this airport and you owe us $1 billion and the interest is going to compound every year. <laughs> in order for countries like Russia and China to be imperialist, if we can understand how imperialism uh, in fact happens, they would have to either enslave or kill millions of people over hundreds of years subject these people who are left to their morals, their values, their culture, their social, economic, political institutions and functions. It's not helping you build it. It's not bartering and trading. That's not imperialism. Imperialism is a, is, is, is a company with genocide. It's removing a people's will, interest, power. Uh, that's what imperialism is. It's not me saying like, oh, look at bro, I understand you've been put in this situation. I'll help you build your house. But in return, can you cut down the oil prices? Or can we trade oil? Or can you give me grain? Can you give me wheat? That's not imperialism, bro. That's not, <laughs> how, like, come on. Imperialism is a process that happens over, historically has happened over centuries, and it involves wiping out entire peoples and subjecting them to an alien way of living, an alien way of thinking. Uh, that's imperialism. People, it's interesting because people want to talk about business all the time. And, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like very in this culture is like, oh, we got to be an entrepreneur. You got to make some money or something like that. But then you look at a nation that is essentially doing business with another nation and doing better business than the West. Like, are you expecting people just to do bad business for themselves too? You feel me? <laughs> like, that's a very American way of thinking. <laughs> like what, what are we talking about? And if you think about it, man, they're forgiving billions of dollars with the loans. <laughs> Straight up, that is for another nation. That would be considered bad business, mm-hmm. you know. So, hey, I mean, I think a lot of times people will talk about the international, you know, we'll talk about this world politics, and then people will forget to localize it. People yeah, will yeah. forget to uh, nationalize it to their current condition. Yeah, right. Yeah. So for us being uh, new Africans, you know, what is what are these new developments of BRICS, BRICS plus six? Uh, what does this mean for us here inside the belly of the beast in this land that they call America? Well, how I look at it, it reminds us that nation states is the name of the game, right? Uh, and until new Africans, in fact, have their own nations, we will ha- have our own nation, we will have no power, right? And let's remember that the United States promised us the, promised us the nation when it was a special order Number 15 in 1865, which birthed uh, 40 acres and a mule, where they said they would take, I think, 400,000 acres from uh, the Confederates and the slave owners and distribute it to uh, new Africans in the South to govern themselves, to have land. They no. understood this over almost 200 years ago. That the land only was the basis. Europeans that could stay there was military, and they could never live full time there. And that was supposed to be an eventual transfer away from the. And they're supposed to be completely owned, operated, controlled by. Nigga, this was the real black owned nigga. But that's what they. That's them in 1865 <laughs> saying that. you should have a, your own nation. Mm-hmm. That's 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 their own. So if they understood this 1865, mm-hmm. what has changed? Land is. Malcolm was telling us it, telling us 90 years from that. Land is the basis of all independence. That's what Malcolm was pushing in the fifties, right? Land is the basis of all independence. So this is what bricks. With that understanding that I have, this is what bricks remind me of. Uh, and we as new Africans have to remember that we are being subjected to the national interests of our masters. The same people that brought us over here and made us work and toil and suffer and die on this land are the same people that govern today. The same constitution that was written. Declaration of Independence, that's what still governs this nation. Um, and so we as new Africans must mem- must must remember that and recognize that uh, we need to be governed by our own interest, right? An interest that doesn't have us uh, making up 40% of the people incarcerated. Um, and you did some research a couple weeks ago for either... The GDP? Yeah, I was going to say either for our own cadre or for when we went out, but 
as we talk about nation states being the name of the game, we talk about the Republic of New Africa, right? The Black Belt, uh, Alabama, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, Louisiana, and Mississippi, right? The five states that we would like to get control of to have the Republic and make that our nation, the Republic of New Africa. If we were to, when we get those states, we will, as if we were to have it today, we will have the 13th highest GDP, right? Currently, there's not an African nation that is on the top 20 of the world's economies list. But of the nine out of 10 poorest nations, they're all African nations, which is insane because you have a country like Guinea that is third in producing uh, bauxite. You have Rwanda in the Congo, or Rwanda, or is it Uganda and Ethiopia uh, in the top 10 for coffee production. You have uh, Rwanda producing 70% of the world's tantalum, and you have the Congo producing, no, the Congo producing 70% of the world's tantalum and in the Congo producing also uh, cobalt. How are these things happening where you're producing over half of what the world uses and yet you can't, let's look at uh, uh, Niger, right? They produce 70% of the uranium that France uses for their for their power and their energy. People in Niger don't have electricity for themselves. And they're not on the list, but France is on the list though. <laughs> How are you getting all your resources from this African nation? And you in the top 10, but these African nations aren't on the list at all. So this is, this is what this means for us, again, in short, is that the moment that new Africans have a land that they can call their own, specifically the black belt, we will be in the top 20 world economies. And then as soon as Africa frees itself from the yoke of neocolonialism, it will be home to the world's most powerful countries and the world's most powerful people, most powerful people. That's just a, that's just the facts. And if we look at it from an RNA and a technical standpoint, who is going to have the technical skills from living in the so-called belly of the beast to be able to help these West African and African nations develop with the technical skills that we have here? The people who have developed this this country. Period. That's mathematics. <laughs> Period. Point blank. So that's the way we have to be thinking. Otherwise, what else is my question? Is this just going to develop in a certain way based off of lack of infrastructure, lack of a nation state? How is this actually going to develop? I mean, that would be my question. In terms or, of, or what is the highest level of organization? What is the highest level mm-hmm. of development, right? So For new Africans. For new Africans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the highest level? There's nationhood. At this point, it's the highest level. Otherwise, what else is it? We're just all these uh, dismantled uh, places and just different localized things and, and we have no base we have no national territory what are we going to be nomads living out through our- <laughs> that's what i was thinking i'm like bro if we don't do anything for ourselves like if we actually can't ask new app because we're not american right they've been uh, kwame Ture and jamil amin was, tell, was telling us this in the 60s we second class citizens kwame Ture said hi i'm american i can't do nothing americans do because we're saying i am a man even them white, even them white Americans living in the trailers, you ain't American. The American identity and nationality is is preserved for uh, the elite, the bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeoisie who do they boot licking and boot stepping, right? But for the masses of the people, you are what what to have a national identity means what you you participate in the nation. How do you participate in the nation as new Africans when we make up forty percent of the incarcerated population? How do you participate when you own, don't own land, don't own housing, don't own water? Don't own any and control anything that actually gives you life. You don't own know. it. But, you, <laughs> but that's your nationality? You, you, you are a part of this nation? No, you are subjected to this nation. You are not part of it. You are subjected to it. And now they might, we're going we gonna to get into this a little bit later. They might, they engineer, they manufacture what you think is your participation in the nation. Mm-hmm. But on a day-to-day basis, you can do nothing to change your material reality. You don't participate. Nothing. And they give you limited options. They give you limited options. The only way you can change the reality is to uh, make my pockets more wealthy. Is to go drive DoorDash, to go to go drive Uber, to go work in these factories, to sleep on the streets. That's that's your only options to participate. And that's that's what that's what that's what what American nationality is. And your check is getting stolen from you, and it's going straight to the corporations. It's going straight to the people who own and control the means of production. We as New Africans have to start thinking: What does? nationalism actually look like for us what does it actually look like to live and to contribute to a way that a a society functions Mm -hmm. and we're not doing that right now how did how do we not not only just the society but the world period to engage with the broader struggle for Mm pan-africanism that's why it's such a like how can you be a pan-africanist and reject this from a dialectical standpoint 
<laughs> Looking at the rise of the new African nation and then what the new African nation can do to our homeland and support our homeland and support our people here at the same time. I would say on a small scale. We're talking about the 13th biggest GDP. Yeah. We're talking about economics. <laughs> we're talking about, okay, if this a coup happens uh, in Nigeria, which happened, and now they don't have the electrical support to be able to develop the electrical infrastructure, mm-hmm. that the RNA could send engineers to be able to help develop that infrastructure. Y'all talking about, okay, you don't want China. <laughs> you don't want Russia. It was just hypothetically speaking. You don't mm-hmm. want any other nation. And you just want another black nation, a uh, new African nation to be able to do that. Okay, there, here's the RNA to be able to do that. And we develop in a certain type of way. Otherwise, what else are we talking about? <laughs> For real, what are we talking about? We, we as new Africans have to ask ourselves first. We as uh, quote unquote black people in this country, look at your skin for all my people who identify as black. Nothing is black about it, even the darkest of us, right? But for the use of using language that resonates, we as black people have to start looking at even, yeah, I would say more so on an individual level, most of us don't got shit. Most of us struggle every day to to make it happen, whether you got you know, even they got to say people living, making hundreds of thousands of dollars live uh, check to check, right? People making a hundred thousand dollars live check to check. And we know how the majority of this country lives, right? Um, but you have to start asking yourself, how can you start to change your material reality? How can we start to change the collective material la- reality on a micro level, right? For us, that will look like uh, decolonization programs, organizing the community, right? Starting to practice the tenets of nation building of nationalism on a small scale level right and then on the macro is doing what you said once we really uh free the land and have the rna is being able to participate in the BRICS summit is being able to participate on the world stage that's what true uh sovereignty and self-determination is is, without question and be able to decide do we actually want to even be a part of BRICS? that's sovereignty Mm -hmm. making a choice Mm -hmm. (laughs) right now we have no choice the facade of choice you feel me yeah so it's like that's the development that we got to move towards. Otherwise, we can't even take part. We buy multipolar this, de-dollarization that, nigga, but you still a nigga. <laughs> you still a Negro. You still an African American. So how mm-hmm. do we develop in a way to where we actually have agency? And that's why first part comes to identification. <laughs> Identifying yourself as a new African. So once you understand that historical development, then you have a land to fight for. Or let's say even <laughs> let's say you do you go through that process and you say no I identify as as American. How do you participate in American nationalism? Besides tweeting and going on Facebook and your whatever microaggressions and macroaggressions you put out into the world, like how do you actually participate in building this thing? Do you actually agree, the average American citizen? Do you actually agree with the way this country is functioning? Like you really believe, and if you do, well, those people are actually sick. If you actually believe that like healthcare and housing is not a human right, that these are things you should have to work your entire life for, and maybe not even and maybe not even acquire until you well into your sixties, then you can't be saved. This is for the people. Uh, a lot of people. <laughs> this is for the people who are like you know like damn, I think I'm American, but I don't really agree with the way that this world functions, the society functions. Ask yourself, what can you actually do? Especially the folks that are 40, 50 years old and been participating in the so-called democracy for thirty. 30 years, what, what what can you do? And now for my new Africans, you know, I, I urge you to go to some of our uh, earlier episodes where Abbas is alluding to right now, what your national identity is. Because again, we've said- uh, What's Kwame in the Ture, name? Kwame Ture. Ture. What's the name that podcast episode we did back in the day, man? What's Kwa, Kwame Ture, Jamil Alameen, and Malcolm X been telling us you ain't, you ain't no American, you're African, <laughs> right? Uh, and understand what it means to be African and that your allegiance to be to Africa. And for Africans in America, I believe your allegiance to be to the Republic of New Africa uh, and helping us free the land so that we can actually have some, uh, you know, some freedom, some liberation and start to build this thing for ourselves. And then we can complete, com- compete and participate on mm-hmm. the grand scale, which yeah. is, you know, a BRICS. <laughs> That's what I would say. Well, so there's a lot of new developments from BRICS, but then we also have a lot of shifts and in the homeland and the continent, mm-hmm. you know, uh, there's been a lot of coups going on right now. So what do you think these recent coups mean, uh, not only for the continent, but for us as new Africans here? Well, so if we looked at what happened, the coups in Mali, Niger, and Gabon, I would say starting with the first two, they seem to be getting a completely different response from Euro-America, right? Uh, where Mali has been hit with sanctions, 
where France is saying, I've seen different uh, political figures from France basically saying, like, we will die before we just give up power. Sure. <laughs> right? Uh, and why would they just give up the power? Right? When we said, I mentioned earlier how France relies on uh, 70% of its uranium, which is what they use for their nuclear power. Um, they use they depend on Mali. They depend on Niger for that. The European, the EU, the European Union, right, relies on fifteen to thirty percent of their uh, uranium from Niger. That's too much uh, infrastructure and power that they rely, literal power that they rely on, electricity <laughs> that they rely on. They're not finna concede literal that. Power. They're not finna concede that. You know what I'm saying? Especially because uh, if they're trying to maintain their power, you feel me? Keep their people. In their way of life. They, they way keep, of life, but also keep their people subdued as well. Internally, period. We gotta have certain luxuries. We gotta have a certain way of living for y'all to not to question y'all reality as well. For y'all not to start to unplug from the matrix, right? What this is is a glitch in the matrix. <laughs> oh wait, these people woke up. That wasn't supposed to happen. We were supposed to have access to these resources for another hundred years. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? We've been here since uh, 18. We've been in this colonial position since what uh, the 1800s, right? 19th century. We had to revamp it a little bit in the 20th century, but we've been in this position of power for hundreds of years. This wasn't this was a 500 year plan, but now he's got to make some adjustments. That's what they're going to do is make a you know a few adjustments. Uh, and then in Gabon, right, you have a very oil rich country. Now I can't compare it to like a Saudi Arabia or an Iran, but I believe they produce like a billion dollars worth of uh, oil a year. That's as it pertains to their national sovereignty and independence, that could do a lot for their people. That, that could do a lot for their people. Uh, but I think when talking about Gabon, you was giving me a little information on their leader, right? Yeah. Uh, the dude who led the coup. Mm -hmm. uh, the general. Yeah, if you want to speak to that. Yeah, I mean, there was a, information, basically, his family. They say, allegedly, he was cousins with the president. He worked for the dad for so hell he long. Not for Ali the Bongo. He yeah. worked for the dad. Yeah. He worked for the dad. Then he worked for the son. Then he was ousted for a bit. But... He has multiple properties in the West. So you, have you feel me? So you have coups. multiple properties, and they ask him about the properties. They're like, uh, what's personal business is personal business. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So you don't get property in the West as a West African leader or as, a, as an African leader without the approval of who? And then they said, oh, this information became public. There was a CIA investigation. That's the CIA pointing their finger at themselves. The CIA said, okay, we got to open an investigation. We got to look into this, right? So he's Western trained, military wise, by the West, by America. Then he has properties in the West, right? And then if we look at the very, in the way I, the way I try and develop an analysis, I look at what the media is saying. Look at what the CNN is saying. Look at what BBC is saying. Mm -hmm. Very different, <laughs> very different coverage compared to Mali. Very different coverage uh, compared to Niger. You feel me? So. My only time will tell, but my hypothesis so far is that, all right, you feel me? There was actually some, there can be a revolutionary coup or there can be a reactionary coup. <laughs> it looks like, you know, it has a, a reactionary element to it, even though the people who was in power already were already reactionary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it was a reactionary coup to, I think, America uses France as a lackey. Right, if we understand the broader uh, structure of pan-Europeanism, there's the top dogs and there's the, the runts. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? France is up there, but America's still calling the shots. America is now like, we can't trust the French to actually control these neo-colonies anymore. So what are we going to do? We already have our assets installed. We have an asset installed and we're going to use that asset to uh, run a coup. And now we're going to secure some of our interests, our interests right here in Gabon. Because we're losing power in different areas, mm -hmm. or the potential to lose power in different areas. So that's why I think it's happening with this one. You know, only time will tell. That's. But based off of what's happened, that's why I said the two, the Mali and Niger coups, and then, have been uh, responded Burkina to Fasso. differently. Yeah, yeah, uh, and then yeah, Burkina Faso. Uh, yeah, we just we just have to see how 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 it plays out, right? Will uh, Ibrahim Traore actually succeed power in twenty twenty four? Like he said, he will. Um, Sure, if you're doing good, don't succeed it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but he says he wants he to said, at least have like a, a, a true yeah. democratic process, you know? Yeah, and so what if, does that I mean, if you mean sometimes, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I hear it. We're just going to see what happens. Because you know? like, even like you said, if he does, if, if, the, if the, uh, the state, of, the nation of Burkina Faso is on the up and up and you're seeing all these improvements and well being, the living of the mass of the mm -hmm. people, I, I don't think it will make sense for him to succeed power unless this person yeah. is more well equipped to like even. Uh, amplify or do better than him, then I can see him moving. Moving, but I think I mean, only time will tell, like only how time this will actually tell, plays even if out. It's, uh, 
they might even have a actual like you know they've been working on like a federation with Mali. Mm-hmm. So who knows what that's what that will look like by then, you know? So it's, yeah. uh, But do you you already made the point that only time will tell and that if you ever want to understand how if something is, you know, uh in benefit of the masses of the people of any given particular nation, look at how the United States media covers it. Because they want to get you in alignment with what they believe on a mass media scale, right? So like if they plan to invade a place to go install democracy, they'll tell you that like this was a uh, a coup that was not supported by the people. This is a, a dictatorship, someone who's uh, who's in armor with power, who's overcome with power and greed, and we must go in and support the masses of the people. That's when you know some fuck shit about to happen. But if they saying like, oh, we support this leader and we recognize this government as the true government, you should know that it's a neo-colonial force. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say back to original question, I think what this means is it further shows like the struggle for true democracy that's existed since uh, the continent has come with uh, in contact with Europe in the 15th century and European morals and values and economic institutions began to permeate the continent. Uh, and it's important to note that, again, this instability that you see on the continent where all these coups are constantly happening, it's a result of neocolonialism, period, period, point blank. It's a part of that, that struggle, uh, you know, they would say that dialectic of of uh, true independence and sovereignty and for the masses of people to actually be in power. That, that's that's what we're seeing happening right now. Um, and this is, again, a part of the constant struggle for Africa to be in charge of its own resources, bro. We said it earlier, when you have some, when you have the one of the most richest continents in the world of natural resources and minerals, and yet none of these nations are on the top 20 world economies list, the U.S. is on top, is Top two, they produce 96,000 uh, metric tons of bauxite a year. Guinea has a bauxite reserve of 7 billion metric tons. We Bauxite is one of the key minerals for aluminum. Go outside, aluminum's everywhere. Go Street lights, kitchen. cars, you know, all your appliances. <laughs> the United States on its soil produces 96,000 metric tons a year. Guinea has a reserve, a reserve of 7 billion metric tons. <laughs> one is top two. One is not, is not even on the list. This don't make sense. We talk about a, a, a nation like uh, Niger, where it's uh, producing 70% of France's nuclear power. And yet we go out there, you go out there and there, there are people that don't have electricity 24 hours a day. Who, what gives them the right to that? Like, think about that on a mass scale. The people in France live these amazing lives while the people in Niger suffer. Gabon produces a billion dollars worth of oil a year annually. <laughs> but yet that one is one of the poorest nations in the world. The Congo produces 70% of the world's cobalt. That, that's all how all that's how we use these phones, how we use these mics. How we use how the these Zoom cars recorder. start? How we like all these batteries, the TVs, the the lights, our and way people, of life. They fund our complete know. way of living, and these people don't have anything. What makes that right? Who gets to? How does a foreign entity get to determine where these natural resources go? And this goes back to 1884, where Otto von Bismarck and King Leopold II, when they carved it up for his natural resources, and America was right there at the table, right there at the table. This happened hundreds of years ago. Is this, is that, how does that make sense? It, it don't make no sense. And so uh, I see what 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 Ibrahim Chori is doing with uh, is it Abdul Rahman Abdul Rahman from uh, Niger? Rahmania, yeah, probably. Abdul, let me see. I wrote it down. Abdul, Abdul Rahman in Niger. What he's doing is trying to free up those resources so that people in their respective countries, in their respective locales, in their villages, in their cities, in their communities, can have lights, can have paved roads, can have shoes, can have clothes. Ask yourself, I think that tells us everything we need to know about this world, is that African countries produce all the natural resources that govern the way of life for the globe, yet the masses of African people, whether you're talking about in America, whether you're talking about in Ghana, Nigeria, Niger, Mozambique, 
Ethiopia, Eritrea, the masses of the African people live in squalor. Even here in our domestic colonization, they pro- go to, profit go off, the, off, off our backs. Straight up. Mm-hmm. Off our backs. Think I about the it. people who drive, you drive around all day. Are you working at Tesla and that Amazon factory all day? And Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk catch planes from San Francisco to San Jose. On the yachts. What, 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 Super yachts. How is that okay? Like, just like, how, how is that On okay? On a basic level. Because they had the idea? No. If you look at where their money come from, mm-hmm. apartheid South Africa. And these <laughs> these people, a lot of these people didn't even have the ideas. They just had the money. They had the capital. And where did they get that Elon capital Musk, from? Where did Elon Musk get his capital from? Apartheid South Africa. Enslaved African labor. That shit really be racking my brain, bro, that people France gets to so control Niger's <laughs> natural resources. They get it. That, yeah. Like, if you think about it, if you just even, if you look at a map and you say, and you point at France, then you point at Niger. This place and you say this, this place, place controls all of the electricity, all of the resources of this place, and we think that's okay. You feel me? Why? Like what? Like <laughs> they when they was pushing it, they were saying, "Oh, we're coming to civilize them. We're coming to save them, to develop them." If my development, if that's what development is, I don't want it. Yeah, well, it's gonna be a rude awakening for French. For the France nation. <laughs> My last thing I would say of what this, what these coups and shit mean, I think it's a reminder. Uh, Q mentioned this, right, in this in his cadre talks, but like a reminder of the bridge that needs to be built. The same way you would get like a, a Maurice Bishop going to uh, Harlem, a Seco Toure, right? Like, oh. or we was um, even just looking at the snitch uh, from who worked for the FBI during and was like infiltrating the Black Panther Party. Right, he was saying that, you know, it'd be Bobby Seale sitting down, and then uh, a member of the Red Guard from China will come. Like, we as New Africans, and you know, as people from People's Programs, might be listening to this. Or different organ- organizations listening to this. We got to build something that can catch the attention of these African leaders, the same way that they are building things that are catching our attention. Mm-hmm. Like, what would it mean to get Ibrahim Traore over here in Oakland? You feel me, like, bro? That's what we build. Come speak to the people. <laughs> come come to Mac and speak, you know? And shit, Martin Luther King came to Oakland. Kwame Ture came to Oakland. Like, Greta what, Scott King came to Oakland. You feel me? Like, what do, what do, like, what do we build? Yeah. Well, we got to ask, what do we build around here to make these, for these Africans, for all these Pan-Africans that so-called exist in the United States? What do we build to show them that we serious out here besides just, you know, sending money to the continent all the time? Like, it's Africans here that we could be building with. Millions of Africans. Mi- you feel me? Million, literally millions. Millions. 40 of them. <laughs> 40 million Africans here that we could be building with. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know. Like, so what are we doing to uh, build and show? That's what the Panthers did. They show like, now we got a real movement. That's what the Nation of Islam did. We got something real out here. We, we dealing with land, bread, and housing. <laughs> you feel me? So it's an organization. I think we are on the cusp of that. Sure. You know, to where we like, hey, look, brother, this is how much our, our little acre of land is yielding every, every year. This is how many how many meals we provide. Like, this is how this is our cadre. This is our numbers. Like come over here and, sh- and let's start to build. But that that's what this reminds me of. Is, uh, as you see, like, you talk about federations that could be built where you see uh, Burkina Faso and Mali saying, "Now nah, we support Niger and Niger saying, you know, uh, straight up, bro. We gotta have that. We, type, we gotta have that type. We of Oakland, movie California, here. Mm-hmm. second biggest port on the West Coast. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like we talk about, if we actually able to see this type of infrastructure and actually uh, build. And develop resources, bro. We 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 talk about trade, the potential of trade. <laughs> it's a big deal. Uh, so you're right, bro. We gotta think that way. We ain't thinking that way. We still gonna fall victim. Fall victim to what's about to happen in 2024. Hmm. As this, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> what um, <laughs> what should new Africans be out on the look for? Like, how do you expect them to once again? Manufacturing, engineer, uh, democracy, participation of new Africans in their own neo-colonial subjugation. <laughs> well, I think something that's interesting right now is that America is unified, right? The Democratic and Republican Party, they, they unify on certain principles, right? But even amongst the, that uh, unification and them handshakes, like there's still different factions uh, within this government structure, in mm-hmm. my opinion, right? Uh, so we're seeing this right now with, uh, you know, all these uh, arresting Trump. And, you know, obviously he's doing shit, but he's been doing shit just like every other president, if we're being honest. Other, you feel me? So I think it, right now it's kind of like this uh, Democratic 
uh, hunt on Trump and charging him with all these things because they know what's about to happen in 2024. I think CNN ran a poll saying that if Donald Trump was going, if the election was right now, 50% of America would vote for Donald Trump. That's a problem for the Democratic Party, right? <laughs> That's a problem for a Joe Biden who can't even speak for himself. <laughs> That's a problem for them, right? So what they're doing is, like, hey, we got to get, we got to figure out a way to try to get Trump out of the way, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, so taking that, now they also have to figure out a way to get this so-called progressive to go, so-called get this black vote again, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so what I think we have to be aware of is every time, every election year, there's going to be some type of strategy that they use to get our vote. That's just basic politics. That's basic political science. <laughs> they always look at the black vote as this one block, and how can this black vote essentially help swing this election to our to favor? Any, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? What they did in the past, you know, they used uh, progressives to, and they used Bernie Sanders to get all the people, you know, to get these uh, so-called progressive black vote towards the Democratic Party, which ended up voting for who? Joe Biden. Which ended up using what? Kamala Harris, who was a black cop, <laughs> uh, a black DA, you feel me, a black attorney general, right? That was able to garner up the black vote. They used Bernie Sanders, you know, Bernie Sanders had uh, Cornell West as his lackey, he had some of these other... Uh, 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 organizers, black organizers, uh, as they lackey, you feel me? You had even, you know, I think Carol Fife was a surrogate for him, or you had uh, <laughs> Phil Agnew as a surrogate. So you have these, like, black, uh, you know, people doing the job for him to mm -hmm. get people curtailed into the Democratic Party. So I think we're seeing the same strategy being used, but the strategy is a little bit different this year. If you look historically, Cornell West, he is always said, oh, I am, you know, brothers and sisters, I'm against the Democrats, I'm against the... But he ends up supporting the Democratic Party. He was a surrogate, literally, for Bernie Sanders. And then he's like, ah, I have, dis you know, disagreements with my brother Joe Biden, but he's our best option. Like, man, shut the like, <laughs> That means what? You're, you're curtailing all this energy for the Democratic Party. So we're seeing the same thing with him running for president. He's trying to get uh, the black voter engaged in a certain type of way because the black voter is kind of moving away from this engagement of the Democratic Party. Some people are going to <laughs> to the Republicans, right? Mm -hmm. And some people are just like, hey, man, what is this? It ain't in our interest. So he's curtailing the vote. Um, ultimately, in my opinion, what he's going to do is going to nominate the Democratic frontrunner in this haphazard thing. Oh, we have no other option. we got to stop Trump. But what we're seeing, too, now is organizations get behind it to some degree and prop Cornell West up, right? We're seeing these so-called leftists prop Cornell West up. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? <laughs> you know, uh, under this notion of uh, democratic socialism, of installing democracy, of getting power. You know, so we have all these people who came into their organizations or into their beliefs based off of like 2020. You know what I'm saying? So now we're seeing, you know, these organizations start to push uh, Cornell West to a certain degree. Organizations starting to push and you see the language of like, oh, what is true democracy? You know what I'm saying? We're seeing all that election type of shit. But with that, the Democratic Party is throwing money at this shit mm -hmm. to push it in. You know what I'm saying? To push it uh, to the agenda of the people and of organizations in the name of, quote unquote, eventually stopping Trump again. So it's a interesting, uh, what I would say, a counterinsurgent strategy for the Democratic Party again and again. And now it's gonna, we're going to go back to the same shit. Oh, if you don't vote, I don't want to hear anything about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, if you didn't stop Trump, I don't want to hear you complain. It's just all these reactionary texts is going to be happening around it. So 2024, though, is going to be interesting just because you have what we're seeing is, you know, like the arrest of Trump is a strategy on the Democratic Party, I would say. But that strategy is actually, in my opinion, going to backfire and further galvanize uh, these right wing conspiracy theorists, um, and they're gonna further organize. Well, you, you see Trump get a arrested. Do I think the, there's a connection between what happened in Jacksonville and the shootings? Yeah, it's a response. <laughs> so it's like uh, a Trump will get a arrested, and then Trump will you know post his mugshot and saying we got to stop tyranny, <laughs> we got to stop letting them uh, uh, steal elections. And then what does the far right do? They go attack and kill black people. You feel me? Mm -hmm. Like. And it's the Democratic Party helping orchestrate this. So for us, it means that we have to be organized <laughs> on the most basic levels. We need to become organized to be able to defend ourselves. Well, so they protect ourselves from both reactionary elements, whether it's the reactionary Democratic Party or the reactionary Grand Old Party. You feel me? And we got to be able to identify what's going on. Identify these actors that is like, 
uh, claiming to be for black liberation, but then is pushing pushing a policy that ultimately supports the quote unquote democracy of the West. We got to be able to identify that. Yeah, I'm always truly amazed at how they are able to manipulate this shit every four years. Like it's not. It's like I guess uh, the manifestation of uh, manufacturing democracy, democratic, quote unquote, democratic participation tends to shift. But like the end result is always the end result. We got these different people running with the Green Party or running independent or whatever the fuck, create new shit. You always get the celebrity that announces I'm about to run. Like this shit happens every four years. Theater. And then you get the then you get the final the, the final result. It's everyone lobbying behind one is pushing a Democrat. All these quote unquote leftist shit is pushing a Democrat. And then these organizations go back to pandering towards the groups that were that are fed up now. The uh the new revolutionary consciousness that is developed as a result of realizing, right? The people who come into consciousness uh, every four years or so, every eight years, who come into consciousness based off of their realizing the sham uh, democratic process that is electoral politics in this country. Uh, I'll be amazed at it. It's it's a very well-oiled machine, mm -hmm. very well-oiled machine, very, very effective machine. They're very strategic, and they're utilizing everything at their disposal from data to algorithms to thought trends to so these are people who have like a monopoly on all information so they know me? how to use it mm -hmm. and how to manipulate this uh information at any given moment it's down to the science like yeah. literally i took a uh, i took a class in college and one of my professors he was a like he ran campaigns for a living mm -hmm. and like they would break it down to a literally percentages and sciences and be able to predict uh behaviors and voting trends and voting patterns and they knew if we said this word here that 30% of people here would vote for this. You know, so like we got to understand that what's happening and what's coming towards us is a part of a strategy. It isn't something that's coming out of thin air. Like this is all a part of uh, a certain plan and trying to follow a plan to achieve a certain type of goal. This is what they do. They make their living off it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so. Y'all be, be prepared, Rick. I mean, I, I don't know. It ain't alarmist, but it, I mean, it's yeah. a lot of it is an alarm. It's actually like it, it, it's it's actually if we look at what's going on, especially in the global world, if we understand BRICS, if we understand this Russian special operation in Ukraine, if we understand uh, uh, what's happening in Syria, if we understand all that's happening right now is like the uh, the war drums from the West are beaten. The war, you feel me? Like they are preparing for war. I was saying somebody has to pay for war. Somebody has to pay for their decrease in profit. This is what this all comes down to. It's all about profit. So who can put us, who can lead the nation to the most profit? Is if it's the Republican mm -hmm. Party, we're going to put a Republican in there. If it's a Democrat, we're going to put a Democrat in there. Whoever ends up in there, their ultimate goal is to increase profit and dominance for the United States of America. Uh, and so where you have these, uh, this shift to a multipolar world happening, the U.S. still has their profit margins that they're going to try to create. So it's going to be more people in jail here or the cost of living is going to go and the cost of living is going up. And what saves a presidency? War. Yeah. <laughs> War. War. That's what saves a presidency. If they don't think Joe Biden can get elected, if they think the numbers is bad, they're going to kick off a war. The war's already started. It's already, you feel me, they're already, you know, mm -hmm. in Ukraine. You know what I'm saying? But they're going to kick something off bigger. What's what happened with George Bush? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, hey. We need to keep our control, and we got to get these profits back up. And the Democrats don't want Trump at the head of this. So we got to be prepared. We got to build programs, especially as uh, we know what's going to happen with this economy. You know, the basic needs of people, the cost of living is going up more and more and more while the wages are staying the same. Inflation is happening. The wages are staying the same. So... The program, uh, the organization, the Revolutionary Cadre organization needs to be prepared for these conditions that are going to shift, that are shifting. Uh, we have to be able to defend ourselves from a self-defense standpoint. I'm not saying going on defensive, but we have to understand what's going on right now is that they are planning. The right is planning. And there's going to be, uh, you know, we, we've seen this historically, terrorist attacks from them. It's always been terrorism, police terrorism, you know, but we're going to see these far right vigilante terrorist attacks. That's what's happening when they go in and shooting up swords. That's terrorism.
Without question. There ain't just no mass shooting. That's terrorism. Let history be your guide, too. You tell it like, oh, I'm not trying to be alarmist. Um, I mean, you sound an alarm based off of historical facts. And the what has terrain. happened? What has happened every time something has happened against Trump? Against Trump, his vigilantes respond. You move him out of office. January six happens. <laughs> you arrest him. The shooting in Jacksonville happens. It's, this is just what it's the ritual. We would do ourselves a favor to learn, learn, learn what happens. Look, analyze, start to analyze, and ask yourself what has changed since Joe Biden has become president. Cost of living ain't going down. Our collective uh, experience in this nation, it's the same. We're still in jail. We still sleep on the streets. We still wake up every day questioning our, our meaning. <laughs> it's the same shit happen, baby. So more police, you know, more money given to Ukraine, more money given to the military. The Joe Biden's America. Yeah, man. So just uh, we, it may feel like there's no other option. Like that's what that's what they want us to believe. That's why you get the Democrats saying, or you get these uh, Cornell West. You know what he's gonna do? The same thing he did for Bernie and Biden, and say we got to vote for the lesser two evils. But there are other options out there. And the people is the other option. Investing, in getting in touch with the masses, the organizing, doing that real grassroots work, and the grassroots organizations who don't start off as grassroots organizations and then turn into lobbying for political candidates. I'm talking about them people who stayed on the ground, who was on the ground in 2016, who was on the ground in 2018, who was on the ground in 2020, 2021, 2020, 2022, 2023. You know, organize, man. Hello, black. 